Well, we saw it throughout the Occupy Wall Street protests and now in Anaheim, disturbing images of police brutality. And while cases of police brutality have gone out through gone on throughout time, the difference now is that it can all be caught on video. And we've played it for you. Police resorting to using pepper spray, tasers, batons, and other weapons on protesters, oftentimes decked out in riot gear. So are police expanding their arsenal and enhancing their tactics? To talk more about how police tactics have changed throughout history, Aaron Gupta, founding editor of The Independent, joins us now. Aaron, welcome. Um, so, I mean, what do you think? Are police getting more sophisticated in, the, in their tactics these days? It's not so much more sophisticated as it's the militarization of policing. Uh, a, a lot of the photos and video footage coming out of Anaheim, people have been commentating on this looks like exactly like U.S. soldiers in Iraq. They're in camouflage, full body armor. They're carrying essentially grenade launchers, uh, military assault uh, rifles. Um, but what it points to, I think, is a much more disturbing trend is that there is a tendency on the state now to see the people as the enemy. Uh, and any sort of dissension is then met with a massive force. And this is something that's been a long-term trend. It goes back, I think, to the whole ideology of zero tolerance, that uh, the state will not stand even, you know, one little uh, infraction. Uh, in New York, it was known as the broken window theory of, of policing, which, which has uh, proven to be really based on uh, suspect um, uh, studies. But it was the idea that, you know, you can't even have a broken window in a neighborhood because it, it leads to all sorts of other criminal activity. Similarly, you know, people, if they are just like standing in the street engaging in peaceful protest, well, if they're doing anything to defy authority, they are therefore a threat. And in the post 9-11 mindset, we have to deal with any sort of threat with massive force. Um, and then we add in the social media, which I think the interesting thing about that is a lot of this, a tremendous amount, is being captured on film, uh, in the images, on video, um, live, and yet very little of it is finding its way into the corporate media in the, in the U.S. Um, and th there's a lot of reasons for this that we can discuss, but I think overall it has to do that the corporate media are very much uh, part of the government governing power apparatus in the U.S. They don't care about democracy. They don't care about the free flow of information. They're a business. Their job is to make money, um, and they require having this repressive police force. Um, so they tend to, uh, their inclination is one to totally side with the police. They report everything they say is fact, even when it's a, a blatant lie, um, and that they uh, then uh, essentially white out. Uh, they uh, censor a lot of the images um, that are coming out. Um, and, uh, you know, throughout these protests, uh, I mean, you had mentioned a lot of these things being caught on camera. We saw police using, you know, pepper spray, um, projectiles, um, other other forms of um, and, and other weapons that they've used to subdue these crowds. And I wanted to bring up this, um, I guess, this timeline that shows uh, the evolution of the uniforms that police wear. There it is. You see, in 1968, I mean, it looks pretty, um, pretty run of the mill, um, you know, guy in blue. He's got his baton there, um, gets a little bit more sophisticated in 1995. And, and here you look at 2011 and, and the officer there, you know, he's got a gas mask. He's got a, a 12 gauge shotgun. He, he has a, he can use this less lethal projectile. He can use tear gas. Um, so, Aaron, I mean, what do you make of this? Um, I guess it, it appears that that their equipment is, is getting a lot more sophisticated. Well, well, like I said, it's 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 not so much sophisticated as militarized. That one of the effects of of September 11th, you have these joint terrorism task force. You have huge amounts of funding going towards uh, local police departments coming from the federal government that essentially allows them to buy like millions of dollars worth of toys. They especially, um, a lot of local police departments will use uh, summits like the NATO summit in Chicago or the upcoming conventions 
in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, and Tampa. They'll get grants to buy tens of millions of dollars worth of weapons. It's now common even for small cities to have tanks, actual physical tanks the, the police departments uh, have. Um, and But the underlying ideology is that the people are the enemy, that this is how the government really sees uh, the people in this, this country. I think I don't think it's different than most countries in, in the world, but it, it is interesting to see its evolution. And I, I also don't want to, to say that, oh, somehow there was this like golden era uh, age of policing or somehow uh, the police uh, were less brutal than, as, as we know, in 1968. Uh, in Chicago during the Democratic National Convention, that was a brutal police riot, uh, is essentially what, what occurred there. It's, but now what they do is they do have these standoff weapons. And having been at many Occupy movements across the country, um, over 40 in the last eight months, I've seen the police come out in, in masses. And a lot of it is psychological, that they're trying to intimidate people. You know, when you come out, like in Portland, they are literally covered from head to toe. It really looks like something out of Star Wars, um, that, that they are covered with so much equipment. Um, and it's to intimidate people, to suppress any sort of free speech or dissent. All right. Um, I think that is all the time that we have today, Aaron. But thank you so much for coming on the show. Appreciate you weighing in. That was Aaron Gupta, founding editor for The Independent.